Hello everybody and welcome back. So here we are in our last subsection of module 13, 13-3. This is now where we're going to look at how to do a two-factor ANOVA, sometimes called a factorial ANOVA. This one is a little bit different, but overall it's very, very similar to the other ANOVAs that we've done. We're just expanding on what we started in the first subsection, uh, module 13-1. So it's still an analysis of variance. We are still taking our data set and treating it as one. Treating it as one sample comes from one distribution and we account for different sources of variation. And then we use those different sources of variation. We, we divide them by their degrees of freedom to get these different estimates of population standard deviation sigma. And we do these upper tail F tests to see whether or not we have evidence to support the alternative. And the alternative, of course, is that at least one of these means are different. Now, where the factorial expands on that is that thus far, what we have looked at, so if we go back to the completely randomized design, we had the total variation that existed in our data set. We accounted for two sources of variation, that which was due to any differences across treatments, and that which was just random noise. And so there we had SSTR, we divided by degrees of freedom, that gave us MSTR, and then we had MSE, that was our upper tail F test, right? We were testing to see whether or not MSTR was an inflated estimate of the variance, because what would make it inflated? If the alternative was true, and those sample means were sufficiently far apart, that would make MSTR inflated. That would give evidence in that upper tail F test to reject the null hypothesis that at least one of those samples were different. Then we expanded and we then took into account this additional source of variation, sum of squares due to blocks, due to heterogeneity or differences across our experimental unit. That was sort of, the, again, the extension, like we did in module 10, when we went from two independent samples to the match sample. Well, the completely randomized was three or four or five or 10 independent samples. And then we moved into the randomized block and that was the equivalent, the multi-population equivalent to the match sample, where we had multiple data points for each experimental unit. Well, now we take this a step further. Now we are going to account for the possibility of having two factors of investigation, two variables of investigation, and within each of those variables, we'll have multiple treatments. So now we'll have one factor, we'll call it factor A, whatever is that first variable of investigation, and it is gonna have some treatments within it. So we'll be doing a test to see if we have evidence to show that there is difference across treatments in whatever factor A is. And I'll give it some context here when we get into this problem. And then we'll have some treatments across a second factor. And so we'll be here now doing a second test. So now we have two sets of hypotheses. One to determine if there's a difference between treatments and factor A. The second test, again, another upper tail F test for all the same reasons that we've talked about before to see whether or not we have evidence to show that there's a difference across treatments in factor B. A third test to see whether or not there's interaction, meaning different combinations of treatments are statistically different from one another. And I'll talk more about what that means when we go through this example. And finally, random noise. So here we're going to have three tests. 
one on factor A, one on factor B, treatments in factor A, treatments in factor B, and interaction. So three nulls, three alternatives. Our ANOVA table is going to look very familiar, but it's going to be a little bit larger. So let's get into this practice problem. This is probably going to be a little bit of a longer video because there's a few more steps in this exercise, but you'll notice the calculations are similar except for one. There's one that's a little bit different. Okay, let's get into this. The local animal rescue shelter is interested in knowing if there's a significant difference in the number of animal adoptions between its three largest shelters during its busiest weekend of the year. It is also interested in knowing if there is a difference between the number of cats and dogs adopted as well. The following data shows the number of each animal adopted at each of the three shelters over the long weekend. So here we have our two variables, our factor A and our factor B. So here when we're looking at SSA and SSB. So it doesn't matter which one we define as which. I'll, I'll call our shelter, I'll say this is going to be our factor A. So that's that first variable of, of investigation. And within that factor, we say I have lowercase a equals three treatments. So in previous ANOVAs, we use the symbol, the letter K for the number of treatments. Now we have factor capital A, the number of treatments in factor capital A is lowercase a. So a equals three. And then here, we have a second factor, and that's the type of pet, dog or cat. And as I just said, dog or cat, well, those are our two treatments in factor B. So I'm gonna use lowercase, oops, lowercase two, uh, lowercase B equals two treatments in factor B. Okay, so there's our two factors. We have factor A, factor B, we have so many treatments in A, so many treatments in B. I'm really using a minimal number of treatments, three and two, but we could have many, many, many treatments in both of those factors. I'm just using a small number of treatments, again, just to keep the calculations as simple as possible. They'll still be tedious, but as simple as we can possibly make them. Now, this issue of interaction, well, here I can see for dogs. So that's that one type of pet. Well, I have dogs in shelter A, dogs in shelter B, dogs in shelter C. I also can see I have cats in shelter A, B, and C. So when I talk about treatment combinations, and when we talk about whether or not we have evidence to show that there's an interaction, meaning maybe the average number of dogs at shelter A is different from the average number of dogs at shelter B compared to the average dogs in shelter C, compared to the average cats in shelter B and C, et cetera. So we're looking at all of those possible interactions. And so here, I'll see, we can see I have R equals three inter, um, replications, the number of observations per treatment combination. So I can see I have three observations for the number of cats at each of the three shelters, and I have here three observations for the number of dogs. So that's how many times each treatment combination has been replicated. I have three data points for each combination of those treatments, okay? Now, we also have a whole bunch of means. I have the treatment means, which is the average number of dogs that were adopted. Here I have the average number of cats that were adopted. Here I have treatment means across factor A. The average number of pets that were adopted in shelter A the average pets adopted in shelter B, average pets in shelter C. So those are our treatment means, the same as any other mean, the same as any other treatment mean that we've ever calculated. What's a little bit different here now 
are these interaction means. Those are the means for these combinations. So this first 2.67, that's the mean of just those three replications. 1.33, that's the mean of just those three. 2.3, that's just the mean of those three, and so on. The five, that's these ones, the three, and the four. So we have treatment means, and again, let me just be very clear let me just clean this up a little bit because I know this can sometimes be a little bit tricky. Let's go like this. So for this 2.11, that is the mean of all of these nine observations. This four, that is the mean of these nine observations. This 317, well, that's the mean of these six observations. Just like this is the mean of these six, this is the mean of these six. The replication, so here, well, now I'm looking at these three observations. Hopefully that's sufficiently clear. And as always, we have our grand mean. So there can be a lot of preparation for this type of exercise because you have to calculate all of these treatment means, grand means, replication means, or interaction means. Once you've got all of that preparatory work done, the calculations are all going to be very similar with the one exception, the interaction is a little bit different and can be a little bit tedious. I'm going to clean this up again because I'm going to mess it up excuse me, as we go through the problem. Okay, so let's put together our ANOVA. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna do it down here a little bit just so that I have more room up above to do my calculation. So normally what we would do, right, I would, I would just write the first one as treatment and then whatever below. But here, because I've got treatments that belong to two different factors, um, I'm not going to write treatment here. I'm going to write actually the name of the factor. So I have somewhat arbitrarily called shelter as my factor A. So I'll put here as my first factor the shelter. My second factor is the type of pet. And then we have interaction and then we have error, and then finally total. Everything else here is the same. I'm going to have sums of squares, degrees of freedom, mean square, and mean squares calculated the same way. Sums of squares divided by degrees of freedom. Then I'm going to have my F, then my P, and then we'll have a few critical Fs. And again, we have to keep in mind we are actually doing three tests. So before I forget, because I know I always forgot with the, um, the first few ANOVAs, let's make sure that we write our null and alternative hypotheses. And here I have three of them, right? So here I have that the mean in shelter A is equal to the mean in shelter B is equal to the mean in shelter C. The alternative, it is what you think it is. At least one is different. So this is for factor A. And then for factor B, it's really the same. Here I have the mean uh, for dogs is equal to the mean for cats. And here, because I only have two treatments, I could actually say the mean of dog is not equal to the mean of cats because there's only one possible difference, right? The reason why we write it like this is because there's a number of different ways that there might be just one that is different. Maybe it's just C is different or just A or just B is different. But in this one, we only have those two treatments, so I could actually write that with an inequality. I don't want to cause any confusion, so I'm going to write it like this, same way 
at least one is different. But I'm sure you can understand how there really is only one possible way that it can be different. And then finally, interaction. This one, the way that this is written, the null hypothesis is that there is no interaction. And the alternative is that, yes, there is interaction. Interaction exists. Okay, so there we have our three uh, tests. We have uh, the skeleton of our ANOVA table. Let's get into the calculation. So the first one that I'll do is uh, sums of squares across treatments in factor A. So this is our shelter. So I'm looking at these treatment means and always the grand mean. Now, you may recall going back to the first ANOVA, that sum of squares due to treatment, that was the fact the, the, the treatment mean minus the grand mean squared. We multiplied by the sample size and then we added those all together. Sample sizes could be different. So that n, that sample size, was inside the summation. And then when we did the randomized block, let me just make this a little bigger. Well, the randomized block, because of the way that experiment was designed, the samples were always going to be the same size. And so the n became a b because we're talking about blocks, and then it moved outside of that summation because it was always going to be the same size. Well, for randomized block, sorry, for factorial, it's really the same, but the notation here changes. So I'm looking at the factor A. How many observations exist in factor A? There exists B times R, number of observations. B is two, R is three, there exists six observations. There are those six observations in these treatment means. So the notation is tedious, but you need to see how the calculations are really all the same as what we've always done. So let's go through SSA. So B times R, that's two times three. And now I'm looking at our yellow treatment means there. So that's 383 minus 3.06 squared plus 217 minus 306 squared plus 317, 306 squared. Okay, so hopefully that's a recognizable calculation. So let's go through, so 3.83 minus 3.06 squared plus 217 minus 3.06 squared plus, did I do that right? Yes, 217 and then the next one is 317 minus 3.06 squared. And then I'm going to multiply that. 2 times 3 is 6. And that gives me 8.38. So here are sums of squares 8.38 degrees of freedom. It's exactly what you would guess it to be. The number of treatments minus one. I had three treatments. Three minus one is two. The mean square, I'm just dividing those. Same as always. So I'm going to divide that by two, and that gives me 4.19. Good. Next one is type of pet. So now that's SSB. SSB. So again, here we're looking at those differences between those sample means, so the means of treatments in factor B, 
So the, oops, these treatment means here and here. Let me just clean this up. And of course our grand mean. So that's going to be those differences squared. We're going to add those up across factors, uh, treatments in factor B. And then what do you think we're going to multiply by? We're going to multiply by the number of observations in each of those treatment means. Now I can just look at that and I can see that it's nine. What does the formula say? The formula is going to be A times R. I have A is three times R is three, nine observations. Okay, so let's go through that calculation. So I have 2.11 is my first, whoops. So this is three times three, 2.11 minus that same grand mean. And then the next one is four. And that's it, that one's a little bit simpler. So 2.11 minus 3.06 squared plus four minus 3.06 squared. Multiply that by nine and I have 16.07. Oh, uh, eight if I round it. Degrees of freedom, just what you think. B minus one. B here, number of treatments was only two, so this is one. And so that gives me 1608. Good, okay. Interaction, this one's a little bit different from the others that we have worked with. So I'm just going to clean up this mess. Interaction is going to take a little bit more space, a little bit more time. I won't be offended if you want to fast forward some of these parts. So here's what we're going to do. S, S, A, B. Well, this one's going to have a double summation, which is a little bit tedious. I equals one through A, because here we're going across treatments in factor A and B. Please don't get hung up on this notation. The calculation is tedious, but it's straightforward. I'm looking at those interaction means. X bar I J. Why don't I go like this? Here's X bar I J. So that's going to be these means. Nope, not those ones, these ones. So I have our six means from those interactions of the various treatments. Then I'm going to subtract the red mean. The red mean well, let's call these ones our red means. So the relevant treatment mean, I subtract that from the interaction mean, and then I subtract, let's go with a blue mean, X bar J. And so those blue means, I'm gonna subtract off those means, and then, I'm going to add, not subtract, I'm going to add the grand mean. So it, it's noticeably a little bit different. Here we multiply through again by the number of observations contained in each of those. And of course, here we can see I have three observations in each. So I'll try to color code this calculation as I go through it. It is a little bit slow. It is a little bit tedious. But again, you can fast forward once you 
think you get it. Okay, so what I'm going to do here, I'm multiplying by r, so that's 3. Whoops. Now, I have our purple mean, so that's 2.67. I'm subtracting off the red mean, which I can see here is 2.11. I'm subtracting off the blue mean, which is 3.83. And then I'm adding back the grand mean, 3.06 and all of that is squared, okay? So just again to make sure this is clear. So here's that 2.66. I subtract off the relevant treatment mean in factor B and the relevant treatment mean in factor A, and then I add back in that grand mean. When we move across to the next one, so now I'm going to be looking at this value. So here that purple is 1.33. The red mean is still the same. That's still 2.11. But now I'm into this treatment mean, right? Because I'm looking at treatment B in factor A. And so the blue mean is now 2.17. And we add back the grand mean squared. So that's two of the six, yeah? You can see how, you know, this is not usually anybody's favorite calculation to do. The next one, now we're at 2.33. So here we'll come down to the next line for our purple is 2.33. Now my red mean hasn't changed yet. That's still the 2.11. I'm still in that dog, still in treatment uh, a of factor B. The blue mean has changed. Now I'm over here, 317. And the grand mean never changes. Okay, so that's the first row. So now we have done these three interaction means. Now I'm going to come down to the next one. So I'm at, in my purple here, I'm at number five. So this is five minus, now my red mean has changed, right? Now I'm down here, five minus four minus, here that blue mean is 383, plus the grand mean, which never changes, plus two more. Everybody gets it now, I hope. Three minus four. Oh, I should keep to my color coding. Now I'm just going too fast. Three red mean is four. Blue mean is 217 plus 3.06 squared. And finally, now we're over here, four minus 4, minus 317, plus 3.06 squared. Whew. Now, I just feel like at some point I'm going to get some emails from some of the eagle-eyed students who see that there's a mistake in here somewhere because it's so easy to make a mistake in here. As you can see, this is a very tedious calculation and there's plenty of room for error. So let's go through and see what we get. So I'm starting at the top. 267 minus 211 minus 383 plus 3.06, all of that squared, plus 1.33 minus 211 minus 217 plus 3.06, all of that squared, plus 2.33 minus 211 minus 317 plus 306 squared, plus 5 minus 4 minus 383 plus 306 squared, 
plus 3 minus 4 minus 217 plus 306 squared. I'm on the last one. I hope I haven't made a mistake. 4 minus 4 minus 317 plus 306, all of that squared, times that by 3. And I have 0.43. All of that for just a little number, 0.43. Oh, yeah, 0.44, I guess I'll round that more appropriately. Okay, good. Degrees of freedom. Nothing too fancy. You've seen this one before. A minus 1 times B minus 1. So this is just the product of what's above it. So that's 2. Now I'm going to take that 44 divided by 2.22. Now, Remember when we talked in the randomized block design, how the math requirements for SSE, beyond the scope of this course, matrix algebra required. So I either give you SSE or I give you SST. Here, of course, we've solved for the others. So knowing how those are all related, as we can see here, if I give you one, you can solve for the other. And here I can see we have SST is given to us 36.94. So if this is 36.94, well now I can just work backwards. And if I take 36.94 and I subtract all of those other bits of variation, minus 0.44, minus 16.08, minus 8.38. Well, what's left must be error. The degrees of freedom on error. This one's a little bit different. This is A times B times R minus 1. A was 3. B is 2, so there we have 6. R minus 1, that's 3 minus 1 is 2, so 6 times 2. Here I have 12, right? Let me just make that clear. So A, remember up here, A was 3, B is 2, R is 3, so this is 3 times 2 times 3 minus 1. So that gives us 12 degrees of freedom. SST, this one's always the same. NT minus 1. And so if I come up here and we look at how many observations I have, I have 18 observations. So 18 minus 1 is 17. And again, if I add up everything above it, 12, 14, 15, 16, 17. It all adds up, everything above it. So let's finish this off. I need MSE. So I need this value here. That is 12.04 divided by 12. Whoops. And that gives me my MSE of almost perfectly 1. OK. Now we're all set. We have everything. We can finally calculate our test statistics. We have three tests. So we have three test statistics. One for the test on factor A, one for the test on factor B, one for the test on interaction. That first one, it's the same. Remember it was MSTR, mean squared treatments. So of course now we distinguish between treatments in factor A and factor B. So this is MSA, mean squared due to treatments in factor A, divided by MSE. This one, MSB, mean squared due to treatments in factor B, also divided by MSE. And finally, mean squared due to interaction. And these are all the same kind of tests. These are all upper tail F tests. These are all estimates of the unknown population variance. 
if the relevant alternative is valid, and I say relevant because we have three alternatives, if the relevant alternative is valid, then the corresponding mean squared estimate is going to be inflated. So when we look at this first one, MSA over MSE, well, that's 4.19 divided by 1. So 419. If that alternative is true, then MSA is an inflated estimate of variance for the same reasons as we described in the first completely randomized ANOVA. So I hope that all of this sounds so familiar to you. So with that denominator is one, these calculations all become quite, quite easy. This is going to be 1608 interaction 0.22. I probably I have some rounding error in here. That's perfectly all right. Okay, let's, uh, we don't have a level of significance here. So we'll do these at the 05 level of significance. Now, it's important to note that these tests might all come from a different distribution because they, have, they, they can have different degrees of freedom. The denominator degrees of freedom is always the same because MSE, 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 it's always the same in the denominator. But the numerator degrees of freedom can be different depending on the number of treatments in each of those factors. So let's do shelter first. Shelter, I have two numerator degrees of freedom. And again, all of them are 12. So two numerator, 12 denominator degrees of freedom. So here's two numerator, 12 denominator degrees of freedom. Here are my relevant values. If I'm gonna pull out a critical value at 05, well, that's going to be 3.885. So here I have that critical is 3.885. If I want the p-value, so there my test statistic is 419. So my p-value there, this is so small, let me keep that clean. My p-value, well, my test statistic is in between. So my p-value is going to be between 0.025 and 0.05. So it's less than 0.05, greater than 0.025. Let's hold off on our conclusion until we finish these up. Type of pet, one degree of freedom in the numerator and still 12 in the denominator. So I come down here. Here I have one in the numerator, 12 in the denominator. So here are my relevant values. Well, certainly my test statistic there was 16. So it's just off the charts, right? Here my test, my, my critical value is 4.75. My test statistic is, is larger than that largest value, right? So it's way out in the extreme of that distribution. So my p-value is something much less than 0.01. So here's my critical value for that test was 475. My p-value is something much less than 0.01. Interaction, now I'm back to two degrees of freedom in the numerator, still 12 in the denominator. So two and 12. So that critical value is gonna be the same, 3.885. Our test statistic, 0.22. That test statistic is tiny. It's smaller than the smallest, which means the p-value is larger than the largest. So I have that Critical value, 3885. My p-value here is larger than 0.1. Okay, sorry this was such a long video. There's a lot to these, uh, no, uh, these factorials. So here we have all of our results. 
we have sufficient evidence to reject the null hypotheses on factor A, which means we, have, we do have evidence to show that there is a difference in the average number of adopted animals between these three shelters. Which one? Well, go do a Fisher's LSD and find out which one or which ones are different. All I'm going to worry about here is that we have evidence to show at least one of them is different. If we look at the next one, the type of pet. Well, that p-value is also less than our level of significance, just as that one was. So here we reject. We have sufficient evidence to show that there is a difference, a statistically significant difference, in the average number of uh, cats versus dogs. And so again, there's only that one possible pair, so I know that the average number of cats and the average number of dogs are different. I don't need to do a Fisher's LSD there because there's only two treatments. If we had multiple treatments, well then maybe we want to do a Fisher's LSD there as well to find out where the difference exists. Finally, on interaction, our p-value there is quite large. So we lack evidence. We are unable to say that there are any specific combinations of type of pet and shelter that are statistically different from the others. Okay, that's it. I hope that this was helpful, albeit long. I'll, I'm so pleased if you guys get through these long videos. Hopefully that was helpful. The next videos um, for these problems in uh, the factorial ANOVA will keep them a little bit shorter. Less talking, more writing, more doing. Okay, guys, thank you all so much for watching. I hope this was helpful. Bye-bye.